Thank you guys very much. How many of you do remember last year? Let me see a show of hands. Well, guys and gals, I remember you all. And I remember you with great uh, affection because the time that I was here with you, I had the opportunity to learn a lot about West Star that I didn't know, but I specifically got to learn a lot about people who understood the value of safety, the value of taking care of themselves, the value of committing to helping others take care of themselves. Now, when they called me last year and asked me to come share, they asked me to talk about decision-making, and you know how I did that. I shared my story about being trained as a professional baseball umpire and some of the adventures and some of the lessons that I learned there. You can rest assured and, frankly, be comfortable in that I'm not going to talk about that today. But i tell you what I did learn last year when I was here, and I learned it from the, what, 14, 12, 14 presentations with employees all over West Star, I learned what you like. After the program, a number of people would come to me and they'd go, Phil, you did a great job. I'm talking about folks in the room. And I said, well, thank you very much. And then they'd go on and say, you know, we've had a lot of great speakers here over the years. Well, West Star does a great job of bringing high-quality speakers and their messages into the company. But the thing that we liked about you, Phil, now this is where my ears perk up. The thing that we like best about you, Phil, is your message was practical. Your message was commonsensical. Your message we could use not only at work, but at home as well. Well, you could not give me a higher compliment than that. From my standpoint, that's exactly what my goal is. And I'll tell you very simply what my objective is. My objective every time I stand in front of an audience is to share information that can be used 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for the rest of your life. See, I don't tend to believe that just because we learn something that we can, like a light switch, turn it on and off. In other words, I don't think you can just be a professional in the 8, 9, 10, 12 hours that you're at work. I believe if you're a professional, you've got to be a professional all the time or not at all. Today we're going to talk about common sense concepts, common sense principles of professionalism that you can employ. Now here's the fun part. I'm going to skip with all the definitions. I'm going to skip all of the other things that, that you gave indication of last year that you weren't very interested in anyway. Instead, what I'm going to focus on are the practical con applications that conceptually we can all take and we can all use in our own professional career. Now, here's how I'm going to do it. It's real simple. I'm going to tell you 12 things today. 12. Now, that's a lot. Now, if you look at your chairs, there's not one piece of paper that I put on your chair. In other words, nothing to take notes on unless you brought something with you, which is fine, no problem there. But my intent was not to have you write constantly during this program, but rather for you to think constantly during this program. And this is what I want you to do. I'm going to share 12 concepts that I truly believe can help anyone and everyone in this room be more professional in the days, weeks, months ahead. All right? Now, your job is to find at least one of those things that you believe will work for you. Notice I didn't say you had to have all 12 or 10 or 11 or 9 or 8. Now, if you come up with more than one, two, three, four, I'm cool with that but at least one. And I tell you, I'm going to also check with you at different intervals during the course of this presentation to see how we're doing. Now, for those of you who say, well, I wish I had all 12. I wish I had them in front of me. Don't worry. In the days, weeks, months ahead, West Star will be providing all 12 of them that you can review and that you can look at, that you can consider. We'll get them to you. But today, we're looking for one, at least one. So let me go ahead and start. I have all 12 of these jotted down on a piece of paper. I don't really need the piece of paper, but I have it here to let you know that I already am prepared to talk about 12 specific techniques that can help in professionalism. The first of these 12 that I'll introduce to you, to, to you is a concept that I simply say, well, let's say it this way, always offer your assistance. Always offer your assistance. Now, if you're like most of the audiences that I talk to, when I share this particular point, many in the audience go, I'm already there. I believe in helping my fellow man. I believe in helping when I have some spare time. If somebody's in need and I've known them a long time, they're a good old boy, good old gal, I'll be happy to help them. That's not what I said. I didn't say help them, offer your assistance when it's convenient. I didn't say offer your assistance 
when you like the person. I didn't even say offer your assistance when they need help. I said always offer your assistance. That means you've got to offer the, your assistance to someone when it's not convenient for you to do so, when it's not fun for you, when you really don't want to, and when you may not like them. Did it just get tougher? It did for me, or it did for me early on. I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you. I swear I'm not. When I was a young kid coming up, I was like anybody else, or at least like most people I knew. I was trying harder to get out of work than to get into work. Does that make sense to anybody? I wanted to avoid as much of it as I could. I considered that to be success. The less I have to do, the more successful I am. I didn't understand the concept. But I learned it very early on, and I'll tell you where I learned it. I didn't learn it in a classroom. I didn't learn it in a training session like this. I learned it on an old western Kentucky farm. That's where I grew up, on a western Kentucky farm. I worked a lot with my 17-month younger brother and my dad. Now, again, we get out on the farm. Many of you maybe have grown up on a farm or a ranch. You understand there's a lot of labor-intensive activity with the farm. You know, a lot of pulling, tugging, lifting, shifting, stacking, whatever it may be. And I was out there, like anybody else, like I said before, trying to avoid as much of that, trying to shovel it off on somebody else, if at all possible. And this did not happen once, twice, three times. I can assure you, I promise you, this happened dozens of times to me in my, in my life. I'd be out there working, and my younger brother would, let's say he got a hold of something. Let's say my dad said, Mark, reach over and do that, you know? And so Mark was doing, well, he didn't specifically say, Phil, you help. So I would stand over here trying to look inconspicuous, trying to stay out of the way, trying to make sure he did it. And then my dad would speak up. Now I'm going to tell you exactly, verbatim, what I heard not once, not twice, but dozens and dozens of times in my life. It always started with the same word. Here's the first word. Boy! You know, I didn't know my name was Philip until I was 15 years old. I thought it was boy. That's all he called me. Boy, well, I knew he was talking to me. I'd look up, and then he would say these words. Now, listen carefully. Boy, lay your hand on it. He didn't say it with great compassion. He didn't say it with great concern or care. Quite frankly, he said it aggressively and a bit sarcastically, but I got the message. What he was saying, of course, when he said, lay your hand on it, what he was saying is someone is in need. It happens to be your brother in this case, but it could be anybody. Someone is in need, someone is struggling, someone helps, and you're doing nothing to add to the value of this experience. Boy, lay your hand on it. Well, of course I would. He was my father. What would I say? No. No, I laid my hand on it. I did it. Well, I didn't do it the whole next time because he'd have to say it again, and the next time say it again. But it's interesting that over time, if we think about a concept often enough or hear a concept often enough, it starts to take root. Let me tell you why I know that to be a case. When I was here last year, and I spoke to you during the safety tour last year, I told you about attending a professional baseball umpiring school. Many of you remember that. You've already mentioned it to me today. What I didn't tell you is what happened after I got back from that umpiring school. A few weeks later, I had to find a real job, and so I started putting out applications and resumes hoping to get a job. And amazingly, I got invited to come for an interview at a manufacturing company. Now, it's important for you to know that I knew nothing about manufacturing. I never set foot in a manufacturing environment until I went for my first interview. So you can rest assured I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know what to expect, I didn't know what they needed or wanted from me. I was just trying to get a job. Well, amazingly, I did well enough in the first interview that they invited me back for a second interview. But my prospective boss, after the first interview, said, when, if we bring you back for this second interview, you'll be interviewing with the plant manager. He will be the one that makes the ultimate decision. If he wants you to work here, you will. If he doesn't see the value in you working here, you won't. This next interview is very important. So I was thrilled and a bit excited, maybe even a little nervous, when I got the call to come for my second interview. I showed up for the interview, went in my prospective boss's office, and he said, come on, don't even sit down. We've got to go out to the training building. They're setting up for a training meeting later, later today, and that's where the plant manager is. He, if he's available, we'll just talk to him there. And so 
we made our way to the training building. Now, it wasn't terribly dissimilar, not as nice as this, but it's pretty much an open room. We walked in the doors, and immediately I saw a flurry of activity in front of me. There were a number of people, I'd say half a dozen or so, that were setting up tables and chairs preparing for the meeting. My prospective boss points all the way to the far corner of the room. He said, there's the plant manager over there. I'll go over. You just stay here. I'll go over and see if he's available now and if he can talk to you now, but you just wait here for me. I said, okay. Well, I'm pretty conspicuous. I'm dressed in a suit. I'm trying to put my best foot forward. I'm trying to make a good first impression, and everybody else in here is doing something, working. And then I noticed right over here to my right, maybe 8, 10 feet from where I was, there was a guy, he was struggling with the table. Now, it's not that he couldn't do it, it was just awkward. He was having trouble getting a hold of it, you know? As I'm standing there, and I look directly at him, I knew he needed help. And at that moment in time, I heard a voice in my head. Who, whose voice was that? My dad. And what, that's exactly what I asked. What did that voice say? Boy! Lay your hand on it. Now, nobody else in that room heard that voice, but that voice was unmistakable to me. Boy, lay your hand on it. And I could not, not do that. And so this is what I did. The young man or the gentleman over here, he had totally ignored me. As far as I could tell, he didn't even know I was in the world, right? I just leaned over and said, hey, excuse me, buddy, I, can, I, can I be some help to you? He jerked around. He wasn't expecting it. He jerked around, he looked at me, trying to determine if I was being serious or not. He goes, well, yeah, I can take some help. And I swear to you, all I did was I walked over there and I got hold of that table. There was no exertion to it. I mean, I literally laid my hand on the table, lifted, pulled, tugged just a little bit to help him out. I did not work with him for more than two minutes. Now, the whole time, the corner of my eye, I'm looking at the plant manager. And you know what I saw? I saw the plant manager and my prospective boss looking at me. I saw my prospective boss point in my direction. And then I saw the plant manager do this. And he just turned his back and walked away. With that, the prospective boss started making his way to me. I'm finishing up this little help. Less than two minutes. Guaranteed, less than two minutes. My prospective boss walks up to me and goes, come on, Phil, let's go back to my office. So I followed him back to the office. We get to the office. We sit down. He looks at me and says, the uh, plant manager doesn't want to meet you. I went, oh, man. They didn't even want to meet me. And then to my amazement, he looked at me and said, we'd like to offer you a job. What? I thought the plant manager was the one that was going to make the call. He didn't want to meet me. Now you want to offer me. Now this is what's going through my head. I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Yes, 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 I'll take the job. And I accepted the job, went to work. Six months later, Six months later, in my six-month evaluation, I'm sitting in my boss's office, and he's telling me how I did, what I did right, what I did wrong, what I need to work on. And then at the end of the evaluation, he looked at me and said, well, Phil, that's all I've got. Do you have any questions? Well, I had one that I'd had for six months. And so I decided now's the time. Phil, do you have any questions? Yeah, I've got one. What is it, Phil? Jerry, why'd y'all hire me in the first place? He looked at me and said, do you really want to know? I said, yeah. Yeah, I really want to know. He said, do you remember the day that we were in that meeting room, the day that we went for the interview? Do you remember that? I said, yeah. He said, do you remember me walking up and talking to the plant manager? I said, yeah. He said, what you had no way of knowing is the plant manager was completely against hiring you before you came back for the second interview. I had told him that I thought you had potential, et cetera, but he was completely against it. You, he doesn't have any experience. He doesn't have any practical knowledge. There's nothing he can do to make our organization better. He cannot help us, so therefore I'm not for him. Well, at least talk to him, he said, I said. He said, when we got in the room that day, he's still against it until he saw you helping another employee move a table. He turned to me that day and said, there's no sense in me interviewing the guy. If he's willing to help somebody when he doesn't have to, we can build on that kind of relationship. Go hire him. I got a job because I heard my dad in my head say, boy, lay your hand on it. Now hear me very carefully. Do not miss this point. I do not suggest that you should assist someone, offer your assistance in expectation of what you will get. That's not what I'm saying. 
What I'm saying is, if you always offer your assistance, it's amazing how the world has a way of giving back things that you have given to others without expectation. Professionals understand that if we help people, especially people that are hard to help, especially people we don't like, especially people that are challenging, all too often that comes back, comes back to us in ways we can never imagine. The first step, the first of the 12 that I want to share with you is always offer your assistance. The second of the 12 is this. Take a minute longer than is necessary. Take a minute longer than is necessary. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I certainly have. The world's going too fast. There's too many things all happen in rapid succession. We run from here to there. We finish one conversation or don't even completely finish it before we snatched up our phone and start reading a text of another conversation. Folks, that's not good. It's not good at all. We've got to understand. Now, hear me when I say take a minute longer than is necessary. I'm not saying take an hour longer. I'm not saying waste time, kill time. I'm saying make the most of that extra minute that you have with people. For example, think of three things here. Think about looking. Think about locking. Think about logging. In that extra minute, on the job, thinking about looking at what you've just uh, done to see if you got it all done. And getting it all done means, of course, that you've picked up the loose tools, means that you haven't left any loose ends untied, meaning that it's set for the next group that will come along, be it a next shift or be it a next crew or be it the next individual. Have we done everything? The only way we know is to spend that extra minute looking. We also locking. What about you all know the importance of locking something out, making sure it is secure before you leave it? And the third one is logging writing it down, documenting it, and even if you don't do it physically, with physical documentation, communicating what has been done and what will be done in the future. How many times in my professional career have I heard someone on the third shift griping and complaining about the second shift, leaving them a mess that they didn't know where to start, etc.? But by the time the third shift is over, they go, well, I, second shift didn't do it for me, I'm not doing it for first shift. And the, and the, the process continues. What we've got to say as professionals is we're going to do the best that we can to spend that extra minute to make sure people are in a position to be successful. That too is part of offering assistance. The third thing I will share with you this morning, do more than is expected. Do more than is expected. If my kids, I have three now relatively adult children. I have a 26-year-old, 25-year-old, and a 19-year-old. If my three kids were here, and at this point in the program, before I said do more than is expected, if I would have said, okay, kids, stand up. Tell them what I've been telling you since you were a little kid. Now, they're adults now. They wouldn't mock me now. But as little kids, they, were like, they loved mocking me. This is what they would have said. Do more than is expected. Almost like I'm so sick of hearing this. And guess what? I don't care how sick they are of hearing it. I'm going to keep telling them. Why am I going to keep telling them? Because I know the truth. And the truth is this. If you do more than is expected, you never have to worry about an evaluation of any kind again. If you do more than is expected, you've already exceeded the expectation of others. They're going to be happy. They're going to be happy at work. They're going to be ha the customer's going to be happy with the service they're receiving. Guess what? If you're a husband, your wife is going to be happy. If you're a wife, your husband's going to be happy. If you're a parent, your children are going to be happy. And, and now listen to me on those very, very rare occasions when they're not happy, when they're critical for some reason. Well, you didn't. Stop right there. And I mean this sincerely. You're going to ask two questions, okay? Or one question, and then take action. Here's the question. When someone is critical of something you've done, now remember, you're trying to be a professional, you're trying to do more than is expected, but for some reason you've fallen short. So when that person is critical, you look at him or her and you ask this single question. What did you expect? Now, you do not ask it aggressively. You do not ask it sarcastically. You ask it with sincerity. What did you expect? When they tell you what they expected, because they will have to, because now you've asked. When they tell you what you, they have expected, then this is what you do. You do that thing that they said that they expect, and then just a little more, and they'll never be critical again. They can't be because you've even exceeded the most critical of expectations. 
All right, now let's stop right here. You all know that that's not what normally happens. When I say do more than is expected, you know as well as I do that there's a lot of people that are doing everything in their power to do just enough to get by. Less than what is expected. But you also know those people are never going to be considered professionals. They're never going to be in a position to be able to exercise the opportunities that comes with professionalism. All right, now's the time for me to take a little bit of a survey. Remember what I said, I'm going to give you 12, we're 25% of the way there, we've covered three. Always up your assistance, take a minute longer than is necessary, do more than is expected. Now, quick question, don't hold up your hand if this is not true, but if it's true, how many of you can say right now that you've already heard one thing that you can work on that would help you be a better professional in the year ahead? Let me see a show of hands. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. But, thank you, all of you, thank you. But, it wasn't 100%. So, I'm not done yet then. Let me give you number four. Let's see if this one resonates with anyone. In fact, number four has three components to it. Number four, the fourth idea I want to share relative to enhancing your professionalism is very simply this. Don't whine, don't whisper, and don't wonder. Don't whine. Let's focus on that one first. Show of hands. Be honest again. I know you will be. How many of you in this room enjoy hearing people whine? Let me see a show of hands. For the record, this is the tenth time I've done this presentation for West Star Energy over the last four days. I've asked the same question ten times. Out of hundreds and hundreds of people that have been in the audience, two people have held up their hands so far. And I think they are lying, to be quite frank with you. Nobody likes to hear whiners. Nobody does. And yet, wait a minute. How, don't hold up your hand on this one. How many of you like to whine on occasion? Yes, we do. Oh, well, I'm being taken advantage of. Oh, man, that ain't fair. Oh, man. We like to do it. Human nature likes to whine, but we don't want to hear it. Here's what I've discovered. You tell me if you agree. I've discovered that approximately 80% of the people that you whine to, frankly, don't care. They just don't care. They might be nice, they might smile, they might nod in accordance, they don't care. The other 20%, they're glad it's happening to you. Where does that leave us, folks? It leaves us kind of up a creek is where it leaves us. They don't care, so why whine? So number one, if you're trying to build professionalism as opposed to rob yourself of your own professionalism, don't whine. But also, number two, don't whisper. How many times have I seen this happen in my professional career. A meeting like this gets over. It could be any meeting, but a meeting like this gets over. And all of a sudden you get three or four people here, and you get two or three people here, and you get one or three or two or three people up here in little, little pockets, and they're talking real softly. Now, I'm one of these that just kind of walks up. You know, I'll just walk up, and I'll say, hi, how you doing? And what happens? You walk up, they're talking, and then all of a sudden they fall silent. Now, let me tell you, I'm not a paranoid individual. I really am not, but I can't help but wonder one of two things. Number one, they must have been talking about me. And worse than that, number two, they must have been talking about something that they're fearful that if I hear, I might share with someone else. A secret, if you will. In either one of those cases, if you don't like me and won't, have, and won't, won't face me, won't talk with me, or you won't share information with me because you don't trust what I would do with that information, that tears down my belief in you as a professional. It doesn't build it up. Here's what I want you to understand about whispering. And frankly, it ties right into the third one, which is don't wonder. Don't wonder. This organization, as much as any organization I've worked with, and I've worked with a bunch of them in the last 25 plus years, this organization is seeking transparency as much as I can, I can figure of any organization. You've got Brad, you've got, you've got Bruce, you've got Doug, you've got others of people in lifted, high and lifted up positions in this organization. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that they want you to come talk to them. Now, if you have a question, don't get in your little huddles and whisper about it. If you have something that you're wondering about, go ask. Go ask. Now, let me go ahead and give you a piece of advice. Ask professionally. Don't ask aggressively as if you're going to rush and ramrod your way into something. Don't ask sarcastically. Don't ask mean-spiritedly. Ask sincerely. Hey, I'm concerned about something. I'm curious about something. I'm confused about something. I'd like to know. 
ask the question. What you might be finding is that they'll just answer your question. Then you don't have to wonder about it, and you may not even have to whine about it anymore. Don't whine, don't whisper, don't wonder. Now, number five and six. In the interest of time, I'm going to put number five and six basically together because they are related. Number five says, guard your reputation. Let me simply say, folks, you have nothing else to fall back on than your reputation. Guard it. Guard it for all it's worth. Because, now, I've heard some people, and you have too, and maybe some of y'all have said this. If you have, I hope you'll reconsider. But I've heard people go, I don't care what they think about me. This is just me. If they don't like it, that's it. Folks, that's relatively foolish. I'm not calling you foolish. I'm saying that attitude is relatively foolish, and let me tell you why. Because if you don't care how somebody else feels about you, then what you're saying is, I don't care how they treat me. I don't care what the results are. I don't care what the opportunities that may come my way if I don't care how they treat me or what they think about me. Of course you care about those things. We all care about those things. So therefore, you should care how people think, what people think. Now, that may not mean you are going to change things once you find out what they think, but you need to know what they think. So number five, guard your reputation, leads us to number six. Or to rather, number six, guard your reputation, leads us to number seven. And number seven says, always, always, always protect, protect your, your professionalism. I say it this way, never compromise, never compromise your integrity. For those of you who were here a year ago, let me say this just flat out. I am not going to repeat anything that I said one year ago except what I'm about to say right now. In other words, everything you heard today, except for what I'm about to say today, is going to be new other than new relative to what I said last year. But this thing needs, bears repeating. And by the way, if I get invited back in some future year, I may say it again because it bears repeating. In an attempt to always protect your integrity, Never, never, under any circumstance, ever do anything that's illegal, immoral, unethical, or highly impractical. Never. There is never a right reason for doing something illegal, immoral, unethical, or highly impractical, even if someone tells you to. I've had people go, well, what if they told me to? What if my boss told me to? Listen to me again. Never, never, never do it, do it if it's illegal, immoral, unethical, or highly impractical. Well, that means that I might, I might be hurt some way. Yes, you might. What's the worst thing they can do to you? Fire you. You go, well, that's pretty bad. Yes, it is. But that's the worst thing they can do to you. What's the worst thing you can do to yourself? You can do something that's illegal, immoral, unethical, and then have to live with yourself afterwards especially if something goes wrong, especially if somebody gets hurt, especially if somebody gets killed, especially if you're driving that train. You understand? Never, never, never compromise your integrity. All right, we're six, six in, halfway. How many of it? How many of you picked up another one or two or three in that five, six, and seven? Number five again, don't whine, don't whisper, don't wonder. Number six, guard your reputation. Number seven, always protect your integrity. How many more got in there? Thank you very much. Any, oh, yeah, several more. Wonderful. <laughs> but uh, I still notice a few of you haven't held up your hand yet. All right, my goal is to get you before this thing is over. I may not get you. My by God job is to give you some to think about. So let me give you number seven. Number seven for me is an important one, which is to commit to your constant improvement. Commit to constant improvement. Ask yourself right now, what can I do in the next year that would make me better professionally a year from now than I am today? What can I do? What can I learn? What can I experience that will help me better, be a better professional a year from now than I am today? By the way, the hardest part of that, if you really do that exercise, the hardest part is finding just one thing. Most of us will find two, three, four, whatever. But once you settle on one thing, then listen to me, you've got one step to take. You're going to your boss. I want you to go to your boss. This is what you say to your boss. Hey, come here, I need to talk to you a minute. You made me go to that training program the other day. 
you made me listen to that speaker. Well, he said I should pick one thing, and this is the one thing I picked to try to make myself a better professional next year. I want to do, I want to learn, I want to become blank. How am I going to do that? Help me do that. Now be ready. Your supervisor may throw his or her arms around your neck and just hug you and say, oh, bless you, my child. Because more often than not, we have people coming to us saying, why do I have to do that? Why are you making me do that? I don't want to do that. So when somebody actually says, I want to grow, I want to learn, I want to progress, believe me, it'll be met with a positive response. Commit to constant improvement. If you're not growing, if you're not learning, you're dying. Not physically dying, you're dying on the vine. And that's not where we want to be as we move this company forward for the future. Now, number eight. Eight, I'll go ahead and tell you, eight is one of my favorites. Maybe because it's so fresh, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Number eight says the best professionals, well, they work to solve problems rather than to place blame. They work to solve problems rather than place blame. How many of you all watched the football game Monday night? The NCAA championship game Monday night, all right? 30 days ago, I decided I was going to watch that game, that I would do anything I could to be there because I wanted to watch the game because I knew what happened in the Auburn uh, Alabama game. And some of y'all are nodding, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, Alabama, University of Alabama, two-time national champion, football champion, people were calling them a dynasty, ranked number one in the country. Without question, if they won the last game of the season, which happened to be against our tribal Auburn University, if they won that one game, they were going to go to the championship game for three years in a row, and everybody believed they would win it. And so they went to play Auburn. And for 59 minutes, 59 seconds, it was the most amazing ball game. I didn't like either team, and yet I was enthralled by the ball game. And at the end of 59 minutes, 59 seconds, with literally one second left on the clock, we've got Alabama who decides to kick a field goal that, if successful, will win the game. Now, the field goal is no certainty, mind you, because it's going to be a 57-yard field goal. Now, for those of you who don't understand that, 57 is a long, long way. It's not a given. It's not impossible, but it's not a given. What makes it harder is they send in a freshman kicker. A freshman. See, the regular kicker had missed three field goals already, and Coach Saban was mad at him. So he sends in a freshman kicker into one of the most pressure-packed situations that they'd ever been in. He goes and sends it in there and says, kick that ball. Now, it wasn't a huge risk. It's a risk I would have been willing to take because, see, what Saban was thinking, that if he kicks this ball and he makes the, the, the field goal, the time will expire while the ball is in the air, the win, game on. And if he misses the field goal, it'll fall, and they'll down the football, and they'll go into extra innings or overtime, and therefore, they still got a chance to win. So he sends this young kicker out there. The teams take the field. The young kicker aligns himself, the ball is snapped, he takes his two steps, he kicks. Oh, wait a minute, did I forget to tell you that Auburn also had a plan? Auburn had a plan. The Auburn coach says, hey, Chris, Chris, come here. I didn't even know who he was talking about initially. I'll never forget his name now. Chris Davis, Jr., number 11. Hey, Chris, come in. Go out there and stand in the end zone. Who knows, it may be short. If it is, catch and run. So this Chris Davis Jr. goes out and he positions himself right under the, the crossbar. Oh yeah, now back to my kicker. He takes his step, he kicks. This young freshman kicker kicks one of the prettiest, most beautiful, most online 56-yard field goals you're ever going to see. And yet it fell one yard short of his intended destination. And there stands... Chris Davis Jr. watching it tumble into his hands. And when he caught it, he took off. And lo and behold, he kept running until 109 yards later, he crossed the goal line, touchdown, Auburn wins, Alabama's out of the discussion for the national championship, Auburn is elevated into the discussion for the national championship, which they played for last Monday night. I'm in, the, I'm in my living room watching this game. I couldn't believe I don't like either of the teams. And I'm jumping, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? My wife comes in, relax. I said, don't tell me to relax. Get out. I want to watch the interviews. Now, I'm going to watch all of this. Because I knew that Coach Saban was going to be asked a question. 
In the post-game interview, Coach Saban was going to be asked, Coach, what happened? Now, if I would have been coaching the coach, this is what I would have said, Coach, first of all, tell them how disappointed you are to lose because, man, everybody will understand that. Well, man, that's a heartbreaker to lose. But then tell them how proud you are of your kids. Man, I hated to lose that game. We all did, but, man, did you see my kids? 59 minutes, 59 seconds. They never quit till the very last second. They won the game. They were trying to win. We got beat by a good team. They deserved to win today, but we were right there. And these kids will talk about this game. And oh, did you see that freshman kicker? Man, I didn't, I'm so proud of him. 56 yards. Oh, what a great kick he tried. And I am so proud of these kids. I'm looking forward. They'll be talking about this game for 50 years. They'll be telling, I played in the game. I didn't win it, but I played in this game. That's what I wish. He would have said, that's not what he said. Coach, what happened out there? <sighs> He's been kicking 60 yarders in practice for, for days. We had to win behind him. I don't know why he couldn't find another yard. Right? And then the, the line, I don't know. The so, uh, assignment was missed someplace. Somebody broke down. Somebody didn't cover the kick like they should have. He said, I'll have to look at film and see what happened there. In other words, statement by statement by statement, he threw one 18 to 22 year old kid after another under the bus. It was never his fault. Right? I got disgusted. I got disgusted watching that. Missed opportunity. No professionalism there as far as I'm concerned. I don't care that he does make five and a half million dollars a year. Right? As a coach. I started to leave and then they said, our next interview will be with Chris Davis Jr. I said, I think I can wait another minute or two. I want to see old Chris. They bring Chris in, this 18, 19, 20-year-old kid. He was still jacked up with adrenaline. I mean, he's bouncing. He's so excited. They bring him into the interview room. He sits down. And as soon as he sits down, the interviewer asks him what may be the simple, single stupidest question I've ever heard in my life. This is the question. You ready? Chris, what were you thinking as you watched the ball tumble from the air into your hand? Now, quickly, how many of you have played competitive sports in here? Let me see a show of hands. What was he thinking? Nothing. All he was doing was watching that ball. Right? And then when he finally had secured the ball, he took off. And he just kept running until all of a sudden there was no more real estate to cover. Touchdown. Then we celebrate. Right? Chris Davis looked at this interviewer. He didn't say it, but with that look like, you are stupid, aren't you? He looked and he paused for a second. He said, what was I thinking? Catch it and run. And I went, yes. Yes, that's exactly what you were thinking. You were told, Chris, go in there and catch and run. Don't worry about a touchdown. I know what the interviewer wanted him to say. Oh, I think I can score a touchdown. I think we can get Alabama. I think I can be a hero for all time. No. Catch it and run. And then let's see what happens. By the way, the other ten players on the field for Auburn, they also had an assignment. Go out there and block while he's trying to catch and run. Go out and seal. Go out and do what you're called to do. And all 11 people did their job. And guess what? Amazing thing happened. Right? Look here. West Star is asking you to do it every day. Catch it and run. Catch and run. Don't try to be a hero. Don't try to score the winning touchdown. But guess what? If we're all trying to catch and run, all trying to do our be job to the best of our ability, it's amazing. Amazing things can happen. Professionals don't, don't place blame. They look to solve problems. They look to catch it and run. But by the way, they're also, next one, they're also loyal. Be loyal. Folks, I'm not very good at a lot of things. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. I'm not. I'm not very good at very many things. But there's one thing I am very good. I am loyal. I would have made a great dog. <laughs> you pet me, you feed me, you give me shelter, I'm not going to bite your arm. But you know what's really sad? How many times I go into organizations, an outsider coming into an organization, and the first thing I hear from people inside that organization is what allows the organization they work for. And forgive me, but this is what I think. Isn't that kind of hypocritical? That you walk up and take a check and then turn around and badmouth the very organization that pays your mortgage, feeds your kids, educates your kids, gives you a retirement. I can't buy that, folks. I'm sorry. I believe we've got to be loyal to the organizations that we represent, but we also have to be loyal to the people. A few years ago, 
I was still living in Florida at the time. I booked a speaking engagement in South Central Kentucky, my home state. I flew into Louisville, Kentucky, and I had reserved a rental car that would take me to my engagement. And I landed in Louisville, and I went up to the rental car agency, as I had done dozens and dozens of times before in my career, and I said, I'm Philip Van Hooser. She pulled up my reservation. I handed him my credit card. I handed him my driver's license. She looks at the both, and then she looks up at me, and she says, sir, I'm sorry, we can't rent you a car. What? I've rented hundreds of cars. Yes, sir, I see you have. But, sir, we can't rent you a car today. Why not? Your, your driver's license has expired. Oh, man. And immediately, involuntarily, I looked this way, down this whole list of other rental car agencies, and she saw me looking. She said, and they ain't going to rent you one either. <laughs> so, then we can't rent you a car. If your license has expired, we'll get fired. Well, I understood that. I, oh, man. And then I started thinking, plan B. What am I going to do? Who do I know in Louisville, Kentucky? And immediately, a gentleman's name came to mind. He was a friend of mine, or at least had been years ago in college, a good friend. His name was Rob Gerald. I thought of Rob. I know Rob lives in Louisville. Now, never mind that I hadn't talked to him in 10 or 11 years, hadn't seen him in 10 or 11 years. Rob lives here. I'll call Rob. I looked up the number. I called Rob up on the phone. A female voice answered. I figured it would. Rob's wife, Ruth. I also knew Ruth from college, but not nearly as well as Rob. Okay? So a female voice answers the phone and says, Hello. And I says, uh, Hello, Ruth. And he, she said, Yes, who is this? I said, Philip Van Hooser. She said, Philip Van Hooser. My goodness gracious. How long has it been? I said, It's been a long time. Well, it's so good to hear from you, Phil. Well, it's good to talk to you, Ruth. Phil, where are you now? Well, right now, today, I'm in Louisville. Well, I hope we can see you while we're in Louisville. I hope so, too, Ruth. She <laughs> <laughs> Ruth, I don't, I don't have a lot of time here. I've got to cut to the chase. I've got a speaking engagement in South Central Kentucky that I've got to be to in just a few hours, and my license has expired. They won't rent me a car. Can I borrow a truck? <laughs> all of a sudden, on the other end of the phone, all I heard was, that was it. <laughs> Finally, after this prolonged silence, I said, Ruth, is Rob around? She said, almost desperately, no, he'll be home in 10 or 15 minutes. I said, how about if I call back in 10 or 15? Yes, yes, that would be good. And so I hung up and I sat down. I waited 10 or 15 minutes. And then I called the number back. And I swear to you, this is exactly how the conversation went. A female, excuse me, a male voice answers this time. He said, hello. I said, Rob. He said, Phil. He said, where are you, Phil? I said, at the airport. He said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Tell me where to meet you. That was it. That was it. Ten minutes later, two vehicles pulled up. Ruth driving the first car, Rob driving the truck behind. We all get out on the curb. We hadn't seen each other in 10 or 11 years. Handshakes, hugs, didn't take more than three minutes, max. Rob pitches me his keys to the truck, and he says, okay, he said, the registration's in the glove compartment. If a police officer stops you, tell him whatever you want, I'll back you up. And I got in the car, and as I'm pulling away from the curb, I rolled down the window and hollered at him, Supper's on me tomorrow night! He gave me the thumbs up, and off I was gone. The next night, I was back in Louisville, Kentucky, and we're all sitting and having supper. We're needling Ruth a little bit because of her hesitancy. She was a good sport. But then Rob said, Phil, i got to tell you a story. He said, this morning Ruth took me to work because I didn't have a vehicle. He said, I forgot that she took me to work, and by the time work was almost over, I finally realized, wait a minute, I don't have a ride home. Ruth couldn't come and get me. He said, so I started walking around the office asking people, anybody give me a ride, anybody going my way? And he said, finally, I happened upon a young woman in the office who said, yeah, Rob, I live out that way. You can ride with me, but, but where's your car? Is it, in the, is it in the shop? No, 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 it's not in the shop. I loaned it to a friend. Really? Who'd you loan it to? Oh, you wouldn't know him. He was a friend from college. I hadn't seen him in several years, 10, 11 years at least. You loaned your car to a friend you hadn't seen in 10 or 11 years? Yeah. Why'd you do that, Rob? He didn't have a license. <laughs> Rob, you loaned your car to a friend that you hadn't seen in 10 or 11 years who doesn't have a license. Yeah, yeah, that's about it. Rob, where did he take your car? I don't know. I didn't even ask him. Rob, you loaned your car to someone you hadn't seen in 10 or 11 years who doesn't have a license, and you don't know where he took it? He said, that's about it. 
She said, Rob, why would you do that? And according to Rob, he said, well, he's my friend. Loyalty. Think about it for a second, folks. You don't work with the people that are sitting around you right now and spend more time with them than you do your own family members. Right? Now, let's be honest. You don't like all of them the same. Some of them you don't like at all. Guess what? I don't like all my family members either. <laughs> right? But I love them, and I'll work for them, and I'll try to make them successful, and I'll try to help them. I won't stand in their way. Why? Because I'm loyal to my family. I believe we've got to be loyal as an act of professionalism to our company and to those that we work with. We're not finished yet, though. The tenth one, the tenth one on my list of 12 is strive for excellence, not perfection. In just a few minutes on this screen, you're going to see just how good you are in the past year relative to your safety record. And I have every reason to believe it's going to be Really, really good. But listen to me very careful. I am all for you getting your zero. Getting your zero today. Getting your zero accidents this week. Getting your zero accidents this year. But let's assume that this year, next year, for every year, that you get your zero. That does not mean you're perfect. It means you're pretty good, maybe even excellent. But perfection is sort of a mirage. You work toward it, but when you get there, you realize, I can still get better. We can continue to learn and grow. March the 7th, 2000, I'll never forget that day. Never. I think it was a Wednesday, but I know it was a school day. And at 5.30 a.m. in the morning, I go into my son's room and I kick his bed. Hey, get up, wake up. He rolls over and said, dark outside, what? Get up, get your clothes on, come on, we're going. Get up, I'm waiting for you in the living room. And I left the room. A few minutes later, he stumbles out of his room. He's dressed, but he looks rough. He stumbles into the living room and said, what? And I said, get in the car. We're going to breakfast. Let's go. We left my wife, left the two girls sleeping. We get in the car. We drive across town. He doesn't say much. I don't know if you've been around kids, young kids. They don't say much early in the morning. He didn't say much at all. We get to this restaurant. We get to a restaurant that y'all go to. You know what I mean? The one, the, the greasy spoon diner, the one that the third shift, the truck drivers, the people that come early in the morning before everybody else, before the quote-unquote regular people get out there, the ones that I love to go to, that's the one I went to. We walked in. I saw y'all, but y'all saw that little boy, right? He looked out of place. We walked back to a table in the back of the room. We sat down. Took the lady came and comes and takes our order. After she took her order, I'll never forget, my son looked across the table at me and said, okay, I give up. What's this all about? I said, Joe, what's today? Oh, yeah, it's my birthday. Exactly. How many today, Joe? Thirteen. I said, right again. I said, Joe, let me tell you something. You need to know this. Thirteen years ago this morning at 5.30 a.m., you were born. And I'll tell you right up front, it was the single most exciting moment of my life. I've never had a moment like that before. I pray for another one, but if I never get one, I'm thankful for the one I got. And that would involve you. And since that moment, I have told as many people who would listen to me about my boy, my boy, my son Joe. They say, well, how old is he? Well, he's two days old. He's six weeks old. He's six years old. I've told them as, we, as you've progressed along, and they ask me again and again, is he a good boy? Good boy? Oh, my gosh, he's a great kid. Smart kid, hard work, a little stubborn like his mama, but he's a good kid. But every time I've talked about you to someone... After I bragged on you, they would say, well, just wait till he becomes a what? Teenager. You'll see then how good he is. And Joe, I have heard that so many times in the last 13 years that I have planned for this day, for this moment. Joe, in some cultures, a 13-year-old boy is considered to be a man. So today, at this moment, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to talk to you, man to man. And here's what I'm going to say. Joe, if you don't go crazy starting today, I won't. But Joe, if you go crazy starting today, me too. 
He looked at me. A long moment of silence. Then he extended his hand across the table, man to man. I took his hand. As we shook, he said, I won't. And guess what? He hasn't. Now, hear carefully. That doesn't mean he's been perfect. He hadn't been perfect. Guess what? Neither have I. I haven't been a perfect father. But on those occasions when we are searching for excellence and we find imperfection in the moment, we get together and we figure it out. We apologize. We work it out. We move forward together. We don't let our imperfections stand in the way of our search for excellence. Strive for excellence not perfection. That leaves us with two on my list. Let me cover them. I'll move on and let you get to the more important thing. Number 11 on this list simply says, don't give up, give out. Don't give up, give out. Now that, that phrase may not ring, ring true or may not be familiar to you here in eastern Kansas, but believe me, It means a lot in western Kentucky. Like some of you, my dad used to climb on things. My dad was a construction painter. He painted high structural steel, bridges, smokestacks, dams, other things that needed to be painted. He would leave for work early in the morning, oftentimes more often than not, before any of the kids were up, and he oftentimes came back home after it was already dark. The table would be set. My mother would not let one of us kids, not one, eat a bite, not a bite, until my dad was seated at that table. He was the provider. When he sat down, my mother would look at him, and I've heard her ask him this question time and time and time again. Joe, Joe, named my son for him. Joe, how you doing? How you feel? And again and again and again, I've heard my dad's response. I'm give out. I'm give out. Now, for those of you who don't understand that phrase well enough, give out does not mean I'm tired. Give out does not mean I'm exhausted. It's far more than that. Give out means I'm completely depleted. I'm give out. I have nothing else to give. I'm spent. And he would sit there and he'd eat supper. Then get up and go take a shower, maybe come back and read the paper for a little while. Then finally make his way to bed, and then get up the next morning and what? Do it all again. Just like you. Just like you. We're not asking you to be perfect, we're asking you to give out. To give what you've got. We're not asking for more than you've got, we're just asking for all that you've got. We're not asking you to sacrifice your family and all the other things we're asking you to commit to and help build a family, a loyal family within the Westar organization. Don't give up, don't throw up your hands when you're frustrated, when you're angry, when you're confused. Give out. Give out. It's amazing what you can get. Which brings us to my last point. My last point, and I'm finished. My last point in the list of 12 is very simply, be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful for the opportunities that we have to make a choice. Be thankful for the opportunities we have to make a commitment, to make a contribution to an organization, to something bigger than ourselves. Be thankful. Since I was here a year ago, I've had the opportunity to speak in Des Moines, Iowa, back in February of last year. I flew into Des Moines late one night. I was making my way, or intending to, to uh, the Sheraton Hotel in West Des Moines, Iowa. I called for the shuttle, and a young man comes over, and he picks me up at the airport. It's just a big shuttle bus, and so I move up to the front seat with him, and just he and I in the bus. He's talking to me. I can realize that his accent is not not an American, so I said to him, "Uh, where are you from? He said, Nigeria. I said, really, Nigeria? I said, what's your name? He said, Yusuf. Yusuf, which coincidentally, English translation is Joseph. Joseph, like my dad, like my son. He said, Yusuf. And I said, Yusuf, what 
What, what brings you to America from Nigeria? Oh, I've always wanted to be in America. Oh, when I was a little boy, I wanted to visit America. America, America. I've dreamed of being in America. I said, well, you're here. How did you get here? My wife, my wife. I married my wife. She's an American. I said, well, how did you meet her? He said, well, she's Nigerian too. Her parents were studying in America and that's where she was conceived and that's where she was born. She was born in America. And then they came back to Nigeria and she went to school in Nigeria and she and I started dating. We fell in love. We married. And then after a few years of marriage, she got the opportunity to work as a translator in America. He said, it was the greatest day of my life. We came to America, my dream a dream that I never thought would be realized. I said, what are you doing now? He says, well, I'm working here, but I'm studying. I said, what are you studying? He said, I'm going to be an accountant. I'm down at the university. I can't take a full load. I have to work and study. It'll take me at least two and a half more years before I get my degree, but I'm going to be an accountant. I said, Yusuf, how old are you? He said, 36 years old. I said, Yusuf, do you realize that here in America, 99% or better of the people that I would talk to, if I suggested to them that they could go back to school at age 36 and start a career, preparing for a career, do you realize that most of them would say, I'm too what? Old. And he went, in America? Not in America. America, anyone can be successful. And then he said, I have a son who's an American. Benjamin. Nine months old, born an American. He said, every night before I go to bed, before when we put Benjamin in his crib, I go to his crib and I lean in and I tell him three things. Benjamin, you're American. Benjamin, you can be successful. Benjamin, it's your choice. And I think, how many times do we go to bed with very different thoughts on our mind? He said, I know that my son doesn't understand what I'm saying today, but he will understand as he gets older because I will tell him every day. You know, that's what I think we need to do, is we need to tell ourselves every day that professionalism, professionalism is worth the effort. Professionalism is important. Some of you in this room may be thinking right now, well, I thought this was the safety tour. He sure hadn't talked much about safety, has he? I would disagree. I would suggest that I've been talking about safety with every point that I've made. Because from professionalism grows a commitment to safety. I leave you with the best wishes for 2014. I leave you with the best focus on being the best person, the best professional you can be. I leave you with best wishes and God's speed in all that you do. And I want to remind you that your professionalism is a choice. God bless you, good luck to you, and thank you so much for allowing me to be back with you this year. I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. Appreciate it.